Hello and welcome to the American Council on Exercise live webinar series. My name is Jackie Crockford and I will be your host for today's presentation. Thank you so much for joining us. You are joining us live today, so be sure to use the chat bar in your YouTube viewer if you have any questions throughout today's presentation. Those questions can either be directed towards ACE or towards our presenter as we'll take a little bit of time at the end of today's course to answer those questions for you. Make sure you use that comment box. Also remember you are watching today for free, so if you would like to receive CECs for today's presentation, you will use the link that's provided on the screen that's ace fitness slash past webinars and you will use that link to purchase the recorded version of this course and then you will receive a quiz in your my ace account once you pass that quiz you will receive 0.1 cecs for continuing education once again thank you so much for joining us let's get started Welcome to your course, Kettlebells, Mastering the Swing. I'm Jackie Crockford, I will be your host. And today we have the privilege of being joined by our presenter, Pete McCall. All right, thank you, Jackie. Hey, how you doing? Hi, Pete. How's it going? So today, Pete, you're gonna be talking about kettlebells. Yep. Yes, oh, yeah, yes, I yes. Am. we're talking about kettlebells today. Pete, you've been with the ACE family for quite a long time. You're one of our health and fitness experts and contributor, blog writer. Um, tell us why the kettlebells was such an important topic for you to be talking about today. Well, this is one that I started using this piece of equipment for probably going back 15, 16 years. And it was something that was it's very important to learn correctly. And I see it used incorrectly a lot. When I travel around, I do workshops at various clubs, different countries. I see, you know, some people nail it and other people need a little bit of maybe guidance. So all I want to do today is just go over the swing and how we can do the swing more effectively. Great. So we're specifically going to be looking at the swing, Correct. Um, but all a little bit of progression and a lot of information to get our clients there so that they're safe, right? Exactly. Great. It's all about safety. All right. So here you go. Let's get started. All right. Thank you. So I want to thank everybody for joining me. Um, obviously, you're taking time out of your day, so I'm looking forward to making this worthwhile. I want to go over the, the learning objectives really quick. Number one, we want to understand the benefits of, kettle, of the kettlebell swing. And again, I'm staying focused primarily on the swing. The kettlebell can be used for a number of exercises, but the swing is the one that I see kind of that needs help the most. And once you really learn the swing, then you can progress to other things. We're going to identify the individual components of the swing. Because, and I'm going to say this a couple times today, exercise is movement and movement is a skill. So we have to focus on mastering the skill before we can really start increasing the intensity. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to learn how to correctly perform the kettlebell swing. And you're going to learn how to safely progress your clients from being able to do a hinge exercise all the way up to doing the swing. So before we get started into the, into the actual technical aspect, what I want to do is go into some of the benefits of the kettlebell swing and provide a little bit of history of it. This is always an interesting thing because many people might think that the kettlebell is a relatively new invention. Well, it's not. <laughs> you know, it's been around for a number of years. The kettlebell actually was originally used as a way to implement at farmer's markets. So when people got bored, you know, at a farmer's market or when farmers were, had extra time, they would lift the kettlebell. And the first era of popularity of the kettlebell was the era of physical culture. That took place in about the 18, maybe 1870s to early 19-teens. And kettlebell was one of the primary lifting implements at that time. If you went to any gym in the 1880s or 1890s, this is what you would see in, in that era. You would see fixed barbells, you would see medicine balls, you see gymnastics apparatus, including gymnastics rings, and you see kettlebells. Sounds kind of familiar, right? So really nothing is new under the sun, but kettlebells were reintroduced to the United States about 20 years ago by Pavel Satsuin. He was a Russian because kettlebells were used in the Soviet Union. When you, we gotta look at the Soviet Union, take a step back for a second. Whether you were an athlete, whether you were a soldier, whether you're a worker, you belong to the Soviet state. So the Soviets really understood exercise as a function of health. And kettlebells were used as a tool to help maintain health so everybody could exercise. Now that brought into the fact that it started competitions. They've been doing kettlebell competitions going back to the 1940s. And then as I mentioned, Pavel brought the kettlebell over here about 20 years ago when people started matriculating from the Soviet, former Soviet era to the United States. And the reason why that's important is Pavel was a strength coach for the Soviet Spetsnaz. That was the Soviet version of the U.S. Special Forces, like the Navy SEALs. 
So they, the commandos in the Soviet Union used them for training, and he brought them over here to the United States military. Now, we have to recognize that there are two different types of kettlebells. And I'm going to grab this one right now. This is one type of kettlebell. You see that on the top picture. This is what we call a traditional kettlebell. This is what, when you originally, when I first started doing kettlebell training in the early 2000s, you get kettlebells in one of three sizes. One pood, which was 16 kilogram, one and a half pood, which was 24 kilogram, and, 32, and, and two pood, which is 32 kg. And just for those of you that may not be familiar with metric system, it's about two pounds per kilogram. And I try to speak in terms of kilograms and meters and all that fun stuff. So I'm just, that's all I'm going to mention that today. Everything else I'm going to talk about is in terms of kg. So when you first look at the original kettlebells, they came in what we call traditional. The thing about traditional kettlebells is a size changes based on the weight. So this is a 10 kg kettlebell. That's a little bit more than 20 pounds. The challenge with that is look at my hands right now. On a smaller kettlebell like this, there's not enough handle for my hands. I don't have really large hands. So when you look at the hands on the handle, you can't really fit it. The other thing is if I rack the kettlebell, and again, I'm not that big of a guy, but that kettlebell is resting on my wrist. That's not a comfortable place for that to be. So the kettlebell, when you look at different kettlebells, traditional are okay, but it's not to the larger sizes, 16 kg, 20 kg, 24 kg and up, where it can be more comfortable for use. Because in a rack position, we want that resting primarily on the forearm, not necessarily on the wrist. That's why the better kettlebell, or, or my preferred kettlebell, is the competition kettlebell. And that's down the bottom of your screen. If you look at that pink one on the left, that's about eight kilograms. The gray one and the silver one on the right is 32 kilograms, but they're all the same size. The mass may be different, but the size is the same. That allows for better teaching and better progression up through it. Plus the space, you have more size on the handles. You can get both hands on the handle, and it's more comfortable when you have it in the rack position, the bell is resting on the forearm as opposed to resting on the wrist. So just a little word, if I was starting a gym from scratch, I'd be probably buying primarily the competition kettlebells because they're a little bit more consistent between that. I want to talk just a, couple, just a minute or two about the benefits of the swing. One thing that, where the swing really comes in, and keep in mind that I had back surgery a number of years ago. I, I ruptured L4 and L5, the disc between L4 and L5 from playing rugby. I was a front row rugby player. The back, what the kettlebell swing does, I'm turning to my side so you can see, is the kettlebell swing teaches hip mobility with lumbar stability. A lot of people might look at the swing and think it's bad for the back. Nothing could be further from the truth. What's bad for the back is being inactive. I can tell you my back hurts a lot more if I'm stuck in an office all day or if I'm sitting on a plane for 12 hours. Swinging the 32 kg, my kettlebell, my back feels fine because it's primarily hip mobility. So kettlebell training can work on dynamic hip mobility while maintaining lumbar stability, straightness of the spine. Kettlebell training can increase aerobic capacity. Now the next two benefits are extremely important, especially for an aging population. A lot of times as people exercise when they get older, they don't train with enough intensity. But doing explosive movements and using heavier weights I activates both the type two muscle fibers and increases muscle force production. So that's something to keep in mind. As people get in their 50s, 60s and above, kettlebell training is perfectly safe and the benefit is we actually activate more muscle mass because we don't use the type two muscle fibers, they atrophy. And type 2 muscle fibers, as we may know, are responsible for generating force and generating power. Well, force is just strength and, and power is, is force times velocity. Now, the other thing that the kettlebell training does, especially the swing, is works on the resiliency of our connective tissue. We have two types of tissue in our muscle. We have the contractile element of the actin myosin cross bridges. When they shorten, they generate a force. But around every single muscle fiber, we have connective tissue. So in regular lifts, if I'm doing a regular hip hinge here, I'm working primarily on the contractile element. The muscle is shortening and lengthening. But if I'm doing a dynamic hip swing, or when your clients are doing a dynamic hip swing, that's lengthening and shortening the connective tissue. So we're increasing connective tissue resiliency. And oftentimes in injury, it's not necessarily the muscle gets injured, but it's the connective tissue around that. One other thing, I should have stayed in this position, I'm gonna turn this position again, is kettlebell training, doing the swing, is really safe for the knees. A lot of our clients, as they're getting older, squats and lunges might put excessive force on the knee joint, but the kettlebell is all hip. So when we learn the swing, what we're learning today is how to do a, a proper hip motion. So for people that might have creaky knees, but want the benefits of strength training, want the benefits of power training, kettlebell training is an effect, the kettlebell swing is an effective way to achieve that. 
Finally, we get better posterior chain activation, which gets into anti-sitting. A lot of our clients are stuck like this all day. They're stuck at their desk, whether they're on their computer, they're on their phone, they're stuck in traffic. So they're forward flexed a lot, which tightens the muscles in their anterior chain. Well, working on the muscles of the posterior chain, the glutes, the hamstrings, the adductors, the spinal erectors, the kettlebell swing can work on all those to help improve their strength and help improve our posture. So just a brief word about the science behind the swing. When kettlebells were first introduced about 15, 20 years ago, there wasn't a lot of research behind them. And you would have some of the old school folks in our industry going, rump, where's the research? Show me how the research benefits. Well, the good news is in the last 10 years, there's been a tremendous amount of research. This one study actually sponsored by the American Council on Exercise from 2013 found that kettlebell training, especially doing the kettlebell swing, can improve aerobic capacity by 14%, which is relatively consistent with indoor cycling. So we can, do, we can do weight training and still get an aerobic benefit out of it. Another little bit of research looked at 12 minutes of, of a continuous swing challenge and found that provides significant VO2 benefits. And VO2 is our aerobic capacity. That improves our ability to use oxygen as a fuel in our body. So kettlebell training can definitely do that, help work with aerobic capacity. Another thing they can do, and if you look at the source for this, this is a journal of strength and conditioning resource. Uh, sorry, the journal of strength and conditioning research. This journal has been publishing for the last, you know, the last number of years. There's been more and more research coming out about the benefit of kettlebell training. This one piece found that kettlebell training was good for strength, explosive strength, and overall aerobic, cardio aerobic fitness. So we can train all these things simultaneously using just one piece of equipment. So enough about the science, enough about the background. Let's get into teaching the swing. Now, before we go into the actual components of the swing, I like to take a little bit of time to go over this, what I, with this Venn diagram. And again, this is something I've been playing with because when I think of designing a program, I always ask myself, what am I training? Am I focusing on a skill or do I want to focus on conditioning? Because we have to take a look. You see the Venn diagram on the screen. When you look at a the skill, these are all the attributes of a skill. It includes balance, agility, coordination. And we have to remember that strength is a skill. Motor unit activation, muscle fiber activation is a skill. Speed, power. Power is just strength times speed. These are all skills that we need to train. We need to teach these skills first before we get into conditioning. And if you think about all the high intensity everything the last few years in the fitness industry, we've been putting the cart, we've been putting the cart before the horse. Because what we've been doing is been focused on conditioning. We've been focusing on all these attributes, work capacity, you know, VO2, overall aerobic, aerobic fitness, before we teach the skill of movement. It's not that conditioning, you can't, it's not that you can't do conditioning, but we should really focus on skill development first before we get to conditioning, especially with a tool like the kettlebell. Because if used incorrectly, if the kettlebell swing is done incorrectly, I'm just demonstrating with my spine here, if somebody's swinging from their spine, which I see quite a bit, that's gonna be a cause for injury. So we need to teach the skill of movement first before we get into the conditioning that can provide the training benefits. When we teach a movement, again, I said this earlier, and this is something to clue into, exercise is movement, and movement is a skill that we should focus on teaching. That's why when we developed, I was, I was working full time with ACE a number of years ago, we developed that integrated fitness training model. The initial phase of that model is stability and mobility. Try to restore the stability and mobility relationships of the joints. The second phase is movement, which is integrating stability and mobility. So when we look at teaching a movement, we need to break it down into its individual components. We need to organize the task. Teach each, when we look at a movement like the swing, that's a hip hinge. We need to teach that before we can build it up into the swing. We can practice components of the movement independently, and we can progressively link these movements together, and that's what we're about to get into. Feedback, you'll see me when I start coaching, coaching our client here. Feedback is very important. Number one is visual. Most people are visual learners. So we have, to, as a trainer, we have to be able to demonstrate the swing effectively. And I just go into that pattern automatically. I start talking about the swing, I start driving my hips back automatically. We need to be able to, we need to, be able to communicate visually effectively first by showing the proper form ourselves before we can teach the client. So I really suggest that as you learn this, as you get better at it, really practice so your clients can get better by watching you, watching your form. Secondly, verbal communication. It's not just what you say, but it's how you say it. When you're coaching somebody, no matter what movement you're teaching them, you need to speak with a little bit of authority. You need to be a little bit directive. You need to coach them. The one thing that, that about personal training, guys, let's face it, this ruins us for any other job, right? Because our clients pay us to tell them what to do throughout the day. 
So we need to have some authority when we say that. So when you're coaching, coaching somebody, when you're cueing somebody, the more authority you have, the more believable you sound, and the more people will buy into what you're telling them, the more they'll follow you. Third thing is kinesthetic. I'll show you a couple ways to do kinesthetic cueing to help guide people. That's feeling. Kinesthetic, kinesthetic is feeling. So people learn by seeing, they learn by hearing, and a lot of it is the confidence, and they learn by doing, and we can guide them into that with kinesthetic movement. So when we look at motor learning, and this is really where I want to stay, make this point here. Some of the best trainers I know, some of the best coaches I know, it's not how hard they can make the exercise, but how successful the client is at performing the exercise. And what I mean by that is, good coaches know when to regress an exercise. So it's not just making the exercise hard so the client feels like they're working hard, but it's making that client be able to be successful in performing that movement for that day. So when we look at the swing, regressions are slow, controlled tempo. We can progress it by giving a fast, explosive tempo, and we'll see both today. Regression, and when we learn the motor learning, when we learn the hinge, is using no weight at all. So when we first teach the hinge movement, no weight. As we progress, we can add weight, and then as we get, progress even more, we can add more tempo. Now, one thing real quick about adding weight is sometimes using a heavier kettlebell is a better learning tool. Because like I said earlier, if we use a kettlebell that's too light, then we're going to force it. We might use our shoulders, we might use our back, but if we use a kettlebell with a good solid mass, with good weight, it has to force us to use our hips. We're going to focus today on the two-handed swing. The two-handed swing gives people more control and their body, their spine stays straighter. As soon as people go into a one-handed swing, well that creates a little rotation, a little torque in the spine. That's a more progressed version, which is fine to teach, but today I just want to stay focused on the two-handed swing. Conscious movement. We have to be able to coach people into conscious movement first. That's where they're thinking about what they're doing. That's the cues that we give them to learn how to move. But what we want to do as coaches and trainers is we want movement to be reflexive. I want that young mother, when she bends down to pick her kid up out of the crib, I want her to use her hips. I don't want to use her spine. I want that grandmother, when that grandmother's gardening or that grandmother's picking up after her dog, I don't want her to move from the back. I want her to move from the hips. That becomes reflexive. That's how we know we've done our job as a trainer, as a coach, as an instructor, is when our clients can do things without even thinking, it becomes part of their subconscious. It becomes part of their reflexive skill. The final, final regression progression that we're going to see today is start out with specific rep ranges. When I'm working on teaching a skill, I focus on specific rep ranges and I focus on longer recovery intervals. Because skill is all about motor learning and we need to allow time for recovery. Now conditioning, AMRAP, we'll see, we'll see an example of as many reps as possible. AMRAP is just now we get into conditioning. How many reps can you do in 20 or 25 seconds? That increases that workload immensely. So anytime we look at our progressions and regressions, we can understand anytime we teach an exercise, how we can we break that exercise down so the client or the class can feel successful today. So let's go ahead and get started training the swing. I'm going to bring, bring our friend out here today. Come on. This is Jermaine. He's going to join us today. He's going to be our client. And what we're going to do to start out is we're going to get him started on the ground. So let me have you lay on the ground. There we go. And this is going to be just the basic mobility. So what I'm going to have you do is let me have you start laying back all the way and grab your knees and do those hip circles. So just nice big hip circles. Now this is one of my starting, I love starting with this. And my recommendation as he's doing this, my recommendation, whatever warm up you use, be consistent with it. Because if he's a regular client and I'm consistent with my warm-up, whatever the workout's going to be, I can do my little check-in with him to see how he's feeling today. Now what we're doing with this, I'm maybe change directions. What I'm having him doing is doing hip circles in both directions. I just had him change directions. By laying down the ground, we're taking his spine, normally here, loaded by gravity. I'm taking his spine out of gravity. Here's a little bit of trivia. Did you know you're about a centimeter and a half to two centimeters taller in the morning? Because when you're laying down, you're not being compressed by gravity. At the end of the day, you've been shortened by gravity all day. So when I have a client come in, I want to mobilize the hips by taking them out of gravity. Now what I'm going to have to do is keep this leg stable, keep it out just a little bit, and make circles with just your right hip. Perfect. Nice big circles. What we're doing now is what my friend Michelle Dalcourt calls decoupling the hips. This hip is moving while this hip is remaining stable. So we're getting more motion into the hip joint. It's actually, even though that right hip is moving, that left hip is getting a benefit. And then let me have you switch. Keep, Keep the right hip stable, and now just do circles with your left. There we go. So we're seeing how the big hip circles work. What we're doing now is we're getting that hip joint, we're putting synovial fluid in it, we're increasing tissue temperature in it, and we're doing it without compressing the joint with his body weight. We're taking the body weight out of it. 
So just do a hip mobility, do these hip circles. Now whenever you do is flip over and do a plank. Go and come into the high plank for me. So we mobilize the hips. Now we want to start mobilizing the upper extremity. Because remember, the, the, the spine in the swing remains stable. Now what I'm going to have you do is push your hands into the ground, push your back up into my hand, and rotate your elbows back slightly. I'm putting them on a high yoga plank. I prefer this to the plank on the elbows because we're getting those shoulders charged up. I'm getting his lats engaged. Squeeze your glutes, squeeze your quads, and drive your toes into the ground. I'm trying to get him to engage from his toes to his hands to create stability throughout the entire body. And relax. So now, let me have you pause for a second, give a little break. Now I want to show you the difference. Come down on your elbows and show me a plank on your elbows. When you do a plank on your elbows, you're not getting the same stability out of the shoulder joints. You're not getting the same pressure. There's a direct link from your palms to your hands up in your shoulder joints. I can push him around a little bit more here. He's not as stable. And relax for a second. But by having him use his hands in a high plank, when he drives his hands into the ground and sets his shoulder back, that's getting the entire shoulder complex working and warmed up. Even though we don't use the shoulder in the swing, I still want these muscles fired up and I still want them working hard to prepare for this. So come into the plank again. I just want to give him a little bit of a break. So high plank, elbows tucked back, chest up, push your back up now, push the hands down. So the thing I'm cueing here is I'm cueing him to push down with his hands and pushing up with his back. The opposite directions creates more tension in the system. Push your toes away, squeeze your glutes, and squeeze your quads. I never tell people to engage their core. If I want people to engage their core, I tell them to use their feet or I tell them to use their hands. That reflexively turns the rest of the chain on and relax. So generally a good, a good plank like that, I'll have a client do two or three sets, hold it for 20 or 30 seconds. Again, it's a little check-in exercise to see how they're feeling for that day. Let me have you do a side plank here. Now side plank, all we're doing is opening up. We're getting the lateral slings firing. So turn your fingers away from you a little bit more. Perfect. Bring your shoulder back towards me. Push your hips up. So again, I'm trying to get these competing forces. Hips up, hand pressed down. Competing forces in the body creates more tension. Tension turns the muscles on, and that's what we want right now in the dynamic warm-up. And relax, and maybe switch sides. So he's doing an awesome job. Good, hand down. This is also too, with a client, I'd be checking in. How are you feeling today? I'm also watching, if I'm doing, if I keep my exercises, my warm-up consistent, I'm watching my client move. I can see maybe he's a little fatigued. Maybe he was busy yesterday. Maybe he's been stuck in his office all day. Maybe he's not well hydrated. I'm asking him these questions as we're going and relax. But by doing the same warm-up, again, I'd have him do about one or two sets on each side to get the shoulder complex warmed up and get the lateral sling going. So now what I have you do, keep your left knee down, take your right foot forward. So we're going to do a little hip mobilization, a little hip stretching here. And all I'm going to have you do is push your left hip forward and take your left hand up in the air. So now we're opening up that hip flexor. Lean to your right just a touch and drop your left shoulder back towards me. So drop your left shoulder back towards me a little bit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to demonstrate what the hip flexor does. Our hip flexor attaches here on the lesser trochanter and that muscle will flex and externally rotate the hip. That muscle will flex and externally rotate the hip. So what I'm having them do by laterally flexing and by rotating a little bit is I'm trying to lengthen that muscle in all three planes while he's holding this stretch. And relax. Turn your right leg away from me. So point your right foot out. So that's primarily, that stretch is for the hip flexors. Now we're getting to the adductors. Give it about four or five repetitions, nice and easy. Now mobilize. And during a warm-up, I like to go from doing a static stretch and do a little bit of movement. A static stretch can lengthen the tissue, desensitize the tissue a little bit. Now we're getting a little bit of movement to generate a little bit of heat in there and get a little bit of motion going. Give it one more time and relax. And let me have you switch. Right knee down, left foot forward. And I stay, like I said, I stay consistent. This is my favorite little hip opener. Warm up. So take that right arm up, drop your shoulder back, lean to your left a little bit, drop and open up. Again, think about this. The hip flexor does this motion, so we need to do the opposite to stretch it. Internal rotation a little bit. He's rotating through his trunk, leaning away. Now the other thing I'm going to have you do is cue, squeeze your right glute. Dry, squeeze that right glute. By squeezing the glute, the glute's going to cause it reciprocal inhibition in that right hip flexor and allow it to get a little more length. And relax. Then maybe turn your left, left knee away from me. And let's go nice and easy, just about four or five reps. Again, the adductors, are, the adductors are involved. Our adductors actually flex and extend the hip. So this, this stretch right here is opening up through the hips and creating more motion in the hip. About two more times. One more. And relax. So now we're going to stand up real quick. Let me maybe stand up and keep your feet relatively wide, about a little bit wider than the shoulder width apart. And just do lateral shifts. And what I want you to do is reach down for the foot and shift across, reach down for the foot and go side to side nice and easy. So these are just some lateral shifts here. 
We're starting to move up. I'm taking them off the ground, taking them, now I'm putting gravity into the equation. And by having them do some lateral shifting with this rotation, first of all, reaching for the foot is a little kinesthetic cue. That gives him a target. That gives him a visual cue and a kinesthetic cue. And what we're getting when he does that is we're getting better flexion and we're getting better rotation from that hip joint. So give him about two more to each side. And just this lateral motion, all we're doing is we're continuing on opening up the hips. Well, this is a big hip opener exercise. One more. And this is really where you can see your clients and relax. If he'd been stuck at his desk all day, if he'd been in his car all day on a bunch of sales calls, let me turn and face right here to your left just a touch. Now, this is a warm-up. I'm, I'm going to go into teaching the hinge in a little bit here, but this is part of the dynamic warm-up. So that we might have to teach a client how to do a hinge, but let me bring your hand across here, tuck it in, and about 12 repetitions, knees slightly bent, and just do a nice steady hip hinge. So what we're doing is a dynamic warm-up, just getting his body ready. This is what I would do. So I'm kind of giving you an example of a, of, of a warm-up that we can build into doing kettlebell swings. Keep in mind that if he was a new client, I might, it might have taken me a few weeks to get him here. Because the way I like to do is I like to use stability, mobility, and movement exercises first in the initial stages of the workout program. I have to see how a client moves, give me about four more reps. I have to see how a client moves before I can start giving a client resistance, about three more reps. So right now, this might be week three or week four of the program. It would take me that long to teach him standing hip hinges. Give it one more. And relax. And if he's a, if he's a client that's been with me for a while, the final phase of a dynamic warm-up is doing a little bit of loaded movement. So now, let me have you hold it, keep your knees slightly bent, nice long spine, give it about 10 repetitions here. Nice and easy. Push those hips back, drive those hips forward. And again, this is just a warm-up, so I'm not really going to go into acute coaching this. But again, what I'm looking for, if this is a consistent warm-up, is he moving from the back? Ask him how his day was. Does he have any soreness? How did you sleep last night? You've been drinking water all day. How have you been fueling? How are you feeling? Give it about three more. Because this is where I can check in. And if I'm consistent with these movements, Anytime that something's going on, good training, you'll be able to see, hey, hey man, what's going on? Your back feeling all right, everything feeling all right, and relax. So that's just a dynamic warm-up. And you, I would teach that maybe in the first, maybe with somebody athletic like Jermaine here, that might just only take a couple sessions to go through that. With some of our other clients, it might take a little longer to get there. We know how that rolls. But basically, that could be the initial phases of the program. Now we're going to get into it. So now this is how I teach the swing. Let me be laid down for the glute bridge. So I'm going to use this, uh, an exercise from the stability mobility phase of training of the IFT model. What we're doing is we're now getting into the glute bridge here. Do you see it phase one? What it's going to do is do hip range of motion. Let me have you do it, bring your toes up, and drive your hips up toward the ceiling. What we're now starting with is we're starting with the motor pattern of the hinge. The motor pattern of the hinge starts right here. By doing the glute bridge, we're taking them out of gravity. So I don't have any compression coming down in the spine. We're getting dynamic flexibility of the hip flexor. So that stretching we just did in the dynamic warm-up, we're continuing it here. It's a, it's a body weight exercise. Give it about five more. We're working on the strength of the posterior chain, and we're getting that. By having him dorsi flex, I'm getting his anterior tibialis muscles in here. That can help overall with his leg swing. I'm also having him push his arms into the ground. By pushing his arms down, we're creating more space in the shoulder joint. Give it one more solid one. And relax. Now hold it up here for a second, Jermaine. So this is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for nice and stability. The other thing I would do is if I was working with a client, first time I'm teaching them this, I'm going to ask the client where they're feeling it and relax for a second because we want a client to feel that from the glutes. A new client might say my hamstrings feel it, my back feels it, but we want to cue that from the glutes because the glutes drive hip extension. So I want to make sure a client can do a good glute bridge. Now that could also be part of the dynamic warm-up before we get into doing the kettlebell swing. But getting the client to do a good glute bridge is the foundation of either doing a swing or a squat. So I, if, I, if I can tell a client can't squat well, this is where we start. This becomes the foundation of it. So the next exercise up is actually a loaded exercise. We're going to move up into stage three of the model by adding a little bit of resistance here. So what I'm going to do is give Jermaine here one dumbbell for each, weight, for each hip. Now you could easily put a bar across this. That might not be comfortable for it. Where you want to rest is on the ASIS of the pelvis. That's that little bump right here on the pelvis. And this is what we call a hip thruster. So same basic pattern as a, as a glute bridge, but now we're adding resistance. So drive up with the hips and down. Now the other thing I want to cue is push your heels down. So as you drive your hips up, push your heels down. So again, I'm creating that tension in both directions. All I'm doing now is I'm loading the hip extensors. We're getting more resistance into it. Give me about five or six more repetitions. So it might take, I might spend uh, a week or two with the, uh, I might spend a week or two with the glute bridges before I get to the, doing the loaded hip thrusters. 
but you know, it's one of those things you have to play around with a little bit. Let me give you pause for a second and set it down. So there are a couple different ways we can load. There are a couple different ways that we can load the hips. We can load it with a bar. I was showing you with the dumbbells. There are different ways to do that. Nobody's come out with a, with a hip thrust machine yet. The first person in the market is going to make a killing on that. But the hip thrust exercise is a great benefit. You can see that. What I want to do is give them a little break. Let's show that one more time, Jermaine. Nice and steady. Keep the hands here. Pull the toes up. Push the heels into the ground. Let's go one more time. Give about six reps. Because I want to make sure a client can do this. Now, one more thing about this exercise. Clients with knee issues, clients with back issues, there's starting to be some research coming out saying this is a great exercise because it's strengthening primarily the glutes without putting the back or the knees into play. Give it one more and relax. So I want to make sure, uh, I want to make sure a client can do nice solid hip thrusts before I even begin to think about getting them up on their feet and holding a weight in their hand for hip hinges or for swings. So now with that said, we're getting off the ground. Come on, let's get off the ground. Now that progression right there from the ground, from doing glute bridges, for a client like Jermaine here, that might only take a matter of maybe one or two sessions. And we do that in the first session or two. But for some of our older clients, some of our clients that aren't as skilled, that might take a couple weeks to get them to this point. Now here's where we go from doing the glute bridges on the ground or doing the hip thrusters on the ground. And this is where we're gonna teach. So what I showed you before, what, what we did before, maybe stand right up here and turn to your left just a little bit. So what we showed you before was part of the dynamic warm up. I've already taught him that. This is where I'm now teaching him how to do the hinge. The first thing I do before I have somebody try it is I'm going to do I'm going to give him a little visual demonstration. So this is what I want you to do. I just want you to keep your hands across your chest and I just want you to hinge forward and up. Hinge forward and up a few times. Now notice I didn't give him a lot of information. I really didn't give him a lot of information. That's because I wanted this to be an assessment. So if I see him rounding his back here, if he rounds his spine a little bit, let me maybe turn a little bit so they can see how your spine rounds. So give me a little more rounded spine. So uh, some of our clients might see that motion and they might generate that motion from the spine. We don't want the motion from the spine. We don't want the movement from the spine. We want the movement from the hips. And relax. So what I did was I just gave him an assessment. The only difference between an exercise and an assessment is the amount of information you give a client. So if I give a client and say, hey, I want you to do this a couple times, I'm not telling him I'm assessing him. I'm assessing him. <laughs> but then when I, when I want to cue him, when I want to, you change from the assessment to the exercise, by the amount of information you give. So you can take any exercise and make an assessment by giving only a little bit of information. Now to teach the hinge, let me have you stand just a little bit in front of me, right here, and turn a little bit to your right. To teach the hinge, if I saw him rounding his back, I want you to put your right hand right on the small of your back, and I don't want you to let your back move. I want you to move from your hips. This is where we get into the kinesthetic sense. Keep your feet about hip width apart. I'm gonna guide his hips back. Notice I'm standing to the side. If we're in a gym and I'm looking in a mirror, I want to maintain eye contact in the mirror by guiding the hips back. Now drive those hips forward. That's all we're doing. Do that about four more reps. I'm trying to pattern now. We've been developing this strength on the ground in the glute bridge and the hip thruster. Now we're standing up. The spine is relatively level. We're trying to drive back into the hips. Let's give this about four more repetitions. All it is is that body weight pattern. We're trying to groove that pattern. We're trying to get the hips moving. You can see all these cues here. I want the spine straight. Give me two more chest tall, he's driving from the hips. The knees are slightly bent. Give it one more and relax. So the knees are slightly bent. The reason for this is all these muscles connect, all these muscles, I'm gonna show you here on my hips, the muscles connect from the bottom of the hips to the back of the knees, the bottom of the hips and the back of the knees. So as he comes up, he's gonna pull his hips down and pull his knees back. Now I'm gonna have you bring your hands up across the chest. We did this in the warm up. Take about a step forward and do the hinges again. And so we're doing this. I want to see a client do good about two or three sets of 12 to 15 repetitions. The back is straight, the movement comes from the hips, the chin is staying relatively stable, nice and steady, and we're getting the power driving from the back. A lot of our clients want to feel their inner thighs and their glutes doing a lot of work. Teaching the proper hip hinge will get that firing because actually a lot of this stuff is coming from the adductors as well as the hamstrings. Give it about three more. So this is just a body weight hip hinge. And if you saw, if you noticed, we went from a loaded hip thrust on the ground in phase three, the load phase of the IFT model, and relax. And now we're just in body weight, because now the difference is, I took him off the ground and put him in gravity, so I wanted to regress him back a little bit to teach the pattern standing up before we start loading the pattern. That's exactly what we're gonna do now. We're now gonna go into a loaded hip hinge. We've grooved the pattern, we developed some basic strength, 
So now I'm going to give them some external resistance, and I'm going to start light here. I'm going to go with that 20, with that 20 pound, that 10 kg kettlebell, and now what I'm teaching them how to do is I'm teaching them how to hold on to the resistance. He's keeping that spine straight. Let's give it about 10 repetitions. Nice and steady. A little bend the knee, keep that chin tucked, push those hips back, drive those hips forward. Good. And that's what we're really trying to do now. We're trying to develop the strength. We're trying to develop the endurance. We're developing all that movement here. Same thing. Cues. Notice the spine is really straight. That movement is coming from the hips. This is why the, the hip hinge and why the swing is such a great exercise. We're strengthening the back. We're keeping the back straight, training all the spinal erectors while moving primarily from the hips. Give it about two more reps. Good. Give it one more rep. So we're working on the entire posterior chain. And we can see and relax. We can see how this becomes an anti-sitting exercise. Now, loaded, swing, loaded hip hinges, we might stay here for two, three weeks. It all depends on the ability of the client. But this is where we progress. We start on the floor. We progress up to standing. Now we're doing loaded movement. Now, when we first start introducing the dynamic movement, I'm, gonna have, I'm not going to do a full range of motion first. That's one mistake I see a lot of people make as they jump right into the swing. What we're going to do is I'm actually going to have them start with what we call mini swings. I want the kettlebell to be a little bit in front of the body. So ideally, the kettlebell is going to be placed right where when he hinges down, that kettlebell should be about underneath your nose. So let's see where that is. I know if you hinge down, that kettlebell should be about underneath your nose or your eyes. So that way he's reaching forward. Mini swings now, he's setting into his hip. What he's going to do is keep the spine straight, and he's going to pull this back and just let it swing back about three times. So hike it back and just let it swing forward and back. The setup, and then relax, park it right on the bottom of the belt and bring it up. So you notice how we're being very specific and precise with these movements. To set into the bell for the swing, I'm having Jermaine shift back into his hips, keep that spine straight, and swing just a little bit. What I want him to do, let me show you, have you demonstrate that again. What I want him to do is get used to that momentum and relax and go, about three little mini swings. I want him to maintain spinal stability. If he can't maintain spinal stability here with mini swings and relax, then I am certainly not going to have him come up and try to do it more dynamic. I want to make sure the glutes are active. I want to make sure the spine is remaining straight. And I'm trying to get him to use that momentum. Just don't, don't do it with the weight, but I want you to show me like as you come up, bring up your hands. Because a swing is dynamic. That weight, if that weight comes up, it's creating a lot of shearing force to the back. So by doing the mini swings, let's do the mini swings one more time. By doing the mini swings, I'm making sure that back remains straight. Just swing it back, swing it forward and back. We're loading the hips, and he's getting used to that momentum and relax. One of, the important, park it. One of the important cues here is we want to push the feet into the ground. Now, if I can have you pan down and look at the feet for a second, this is really important. Notice that Jermaine's wearing minimalist shoes. I'm wearing relatively minimalist shoes, training shoes. Kettlebell training is, done, is best done with this type of minimalist shoe or a weightlifting shoe. Ideally, barefoot would be awesome if your gym or facility allows that because you have, want to have great surface contact with the ground. With the kettlebell swing, we get a lot of force from the ground. So if we have a running shoe with an elevated heel with extra cushion in it, you're not getting that kinetic force, that kinetic energy from the ground. So any type of minimalist shoe is perfect for doing the kettlebell swing. So now we're going to progress up. We did the mini swings. Now we're going to do for sets of three. What we want to do is start getting, again, repetition is skill. I'm focused, for teaching the skill, I'm focused on repetition. I'm not going on volume right now. I'm focused on skill. So what I want you to do, you're doing a great job, Jermaine. I want you to really hike it back and just give me nice, easy three. Let it float up, drive from the hips, and let's go. So he's going to hike it back, snap it back, drive those hips forward. Notice that the movement comes from the hips, and relax. So maybe set it down. One common thing, I'm going to have you demonstrate this. The common thing, and I'm sure many of you have seen this, some of us may be guilty of this, but we often see what? Show me that squat to front raise. <laughs> he knows. So squat to front raise. This is how many people misinterpret the swing. They see the swing happening, but this is what their brain knows. And relax for a second. Their brain knows squat. Squat for me. Their brain knows squat. The squat is a different movement than the hinge. There's a lot more force on the knee. We have to remain some, there's some mobility in the spine. And when they see the swing, they think they try to power it up. Show me a front raise. They think so a lot of people interpret the, the swing as a squat to the front raise. Here's the thing. The shoulders aren't really doing much work. These are just a lever. The back is just a lever. All that power, all that, all that energy from the swing is coming from the hip extensors. Let's go one more time into a set of three. Nice and steady. So hinge back into the hip. And what I want you to do is hike it back, snap it back, and then snap. Good. 
And as you're doing this, he's keeping a relatively short lever, and that's fine and relax, good. He's really getting that energy driving. I might stay here for a session or two. Part of it is, this is working on tissue resiliency. This is a lot of load going into tissue. If you go from doing strength loaded hinges into doing swings, that might be too much, too much load on the tissue. The client might not be ready for it, and the client might be really sore the next day. But if you start with mini sets like this, keeping the rep count down low, you're allowing the tissue, the connective tissue, the fascia, the muscle, you're allowing them to become more capable of handling that force. Now we're progressing up into full swings. Full swings, now when we get into phase four performance, we're working more on velocity. But here, again, I'm gonna give you a rep range. I only want you doing eight repetitions. Let's go, Jermaine. Nice and steady. Hinge it to the hips. Notice how he keeps his spine straight and go. The only cues I'm giving now, drive those hips forward, snap those knees back, keep your feet pressing to the ground. Good. Three, good power. Two, one more, and relax. I'm gonna set it down, park it. Good job. Now, what I want him to do next time, he's showing like kind of a little more of a hard style, which is fine. What he's doing is he's pulling that bell down. Here's a little trick for more advanced. The faster you pull it down, the more explosive you are coming up. And you want to keep that into a relatively shorter range of motion. What I'm having to demonstrate with this one now, this is what you'll probably see from your clients, is you're going to power up, and there's going to be just a momentary pause before you pull the kettlebell back down. You want that little pause to help people control it. And remember, we, any, any movement from the arms comes from pulling that bell down. The, the force up should come from the hips. Let's go another set of eight. Nice and steady, let it come up a little bit higher this time. So pop, this is what you might see more as your clients are learning this. And this is perfectly fine, the power is coming from it. I don't want to see the shoulders working, give me four more. I want to know all that power is coming from the hips. One more, and relax. And he's getting that explosive power. And again, what you'll notice is he's sweating a little bit here. <laughs> and that's not just from the lights, he's breathing a little bit harder, you might not be able to hear him. But we're not compressing his body. That's what I love about the swings. This is a safe exercise for your 50, 60 year olds who like to train hard. That's one thing I'm noticing in the gym now. There are a lot of people who have been coming and working out for 25, 30 years. They're in their 50s and 60s. They don't want to take it easy. They don't. They want to go hard. And this is one way, teaching them the proper way to do swings is one way you can bring the intensity of training to them. What I'm doing, I'm giving them a little bit of rest. Now what we're gonna do is a little AMRAP. So I gave them sets of eight because I'm working on skill. This is where I now transition into the training. And what I'm gonna do is I want you to go as fast as you can for 25 seconds and I'm gonna count it. So get ready and I'll tell you when to go. Three, two, and let's go. Nice and steady, pop, good, keep it up. You got it, make sure he's breathing, drive, snap those feet into the ground. You got it, excellent. You got 12 seconds down, halfway through, you got 12 more seconds, keep it up. Good power, good, good. Six more seconds. And relax, park it. Awesome. I got about 24, I think maybe 25 repetitions. You're doing about one rep a minute. That's a freak, that's phenomenal. <laughs> that's, that's great. And you can see he's really huffing and puffing hard. So I'm gonna let him step off here and get a little rest, get a little bit of water. Thank you very much. But that's one way that we do, because you gotta remember, we gotta train the skill first before we get that conditioning. That conditioning provides great results, but we can't start there. We gotta start with the movement. We gotta start with teaching people the skill first. So common mistakes, I mentioned this, too light. A lot of times if the kettlebell is too light, people force the kettlebell. Using a heavier kettlebell can actually be more corrective, can actually teach people a proper technique. We talked about the squat to overhead raise, we want to get rid of that. The arms barely move. All that power comes from the hips. Spinal flexion, if you see anybody grab a kettlebell and they move their spine, take the kettlebell away. They have to work on that hip hinge first. They need to hinge the hips with a straight spine before they grab that kettlebell. Footwear, talked about that. We don't want an elevated heel. Running shoes is too much imbalance, too much cushion. Minimal, minimal shoe, barefoot is perfect. Holding the breath elevates the heart rate, elevates the blood pressure. Breathe. You could hear Jermaine breathing with almost every repetition. You know, exhale at the top, inhale as you bring it down. Use one, make sure you're breathing with every rep. Those are some simple, easy corrections to make. The more you use the swing yourself, the better you'll be at correcting that. So programming the swing. How do we put the swing into our exercise program? And, and keep in mind, I'm a big fan of kettlebells, but no program can be any one piece of equipment all the time. We have to know the proper time to use it. We have to know the proper time to apply it. But if you are gonna add, your, add kettlebells into your, swing, into your exercise program, here's the variables we have to consider. 
Obviously, we have exercise selection. What are the other exercises in the program? The swing is a hip dominant exercise. Are you doing single leg exercises? Are you doing pushing, pulling, overhead lifts? Are you doing rotational movements? Understand it's a component of the exercise program. It's not the only program. So we have exercise selection. Intensity, obviously when we're working on skill, we go to lower intensity. When we're working on conditioning, we use a heavier bell for a higher intensity. Reps, again, skill, I'm counting reps. Conditioning, I'm counting time. I want reps for time. Tempo, when we teach the movement, when I'm teaching the movement and the skill training, tempo is much slower. When we're working on conditioning, obviously, tempo is much faster. Now here's the thing, guys. You can make any exercise program harder by manipulating the next, rest, by manipulating the next, next uh, variable. I already said it. Any program can become harder by manipulating the next variable, and that's rest interval. So if you want to make a program harder, just shorten up the rest interval. Boom, that's all you need to do. When you're teaching skill, longer rest interval because you're working on neural conditioning, you're working on neural skill development. When you're working on conditioning, we can shorten that rest interval. Sets, you know, learning happens between three and six sets. It just depends on how much time you have for the program and the other thing you want to work on. Now the next two are very important, frequency and volume. Frequency is the number of, of times you, you do with swing or doing high intensity exercise program per week. For people under the age of 30 or 35, you know, they can do high intensity exercise three, maybe four times a week if all the other factors are there. Nutrition, hydration, sleep. For people 35 and over maybe, no more than two or three times a week of high intensity training. Swings, high intensity interval training, whatever it is, we need to be smart about that. We need to coach people that yes, you can do your high intensity work, but keep the frequency relatively limited. And overall volume is I'm gonna keep volume relatively low and when I put swings into a program, I only do it for eight to 12 weeks at a time. After eight to 12 weeks, we move on to something else. And sometimes we'll alternate between barbell work, sometimes we'll alternate between dumbbell work and kettlebells. So I might do a 10, 12 week block of kettlebells, 10, 12 week block of barbells, 10, 12 week block of, body, of, um, of dumbbell or body weight training. But I always try to mix it up a little bit for clients based on what they need and based on what they want out of their program. So when we look at programming progressions, again, talking about this, it might take us three to six weeks to get up to a loaded hinge. You know, what I wanted to do today was show you that progression. It might take you three to six weeks to go from that basic floor bridge all the way up to the loaded hinge. From there, it might take another three to six weeks of doing those mini swings and doing limited times, limited amount of swings before we go to swings for time. Be smart with the progression. I would always, my preference is I would rather people come back to me and say I can work harder than have them come back to me and say I hurt them because they work too hard. We can always increase the intensity of a program. I'm always happy to make a program harder. It's really difficult to undo the intensity of a program to uninjure somebody. You can't uninjure somebody, but what you can do is keep your volume and keep your intensity down a little bit and let them tell you, hey, I feel like I can work a little bit harder. If I observe they can work harder, we're gonna drop the hammer, we're gonna go. Otherwise, I'm gonna be very, very careful on how I progress somebody any age depending on the skill. So what you're gonna see on the screen now, this is a basic program for skill. This is where I'm focusing on the movement. What I want you to notice with all these exercises, look at the rest interval. Look at the reps. The reps are relatively low. We're kind of working that strength, you know, strength endurance phase. Rest interval is gonna be longer. Any of these exercises, this is where I'm gonna be putting the kettlebell into the program. I might have that mixed up. You know, swing is flexion to extension. The, the, the TRX TYI is working all extensor chain. Goblet squats, now we're getting the knee movement in there as well as the hip movement. All these exercises are up on the ACE exercise library, so you can access them there. But this would be one example for teaching skill. You know, how do I teach the skill of the exercise? <laughs> this is the fun one. So this is a workout for conditioning. The thing you'll notice here now is we look, I didn't even get into the cleans today, we didn't even get into the one arm shoulder press, didn't get into the deadlifts. All I want to do is focus on the swings. But this is how I put them into a program. I might have them mix up like that. I might alternate swings with deadlifts. I might do a deadlift first and do a swing for a little post-activation potentiation. Might have a little you know, complex training there. Strength with the deadlift followed by power with the swing. Number of different ways you can program it. Notice here with the rest intervals, they get shorter. The kettlebell swing, I'm showing an AMRAP, as many reps as possible for the time given. So hopefully you can see the difference between working out for skill, program for skill, teaching people the movement, now in this program, this program would be something I would use for strength or power if somebody has a requisite thing. So I want to thank you for joining us today. It's been a pleasure bringing you a little more information about the kettlebell swing. I'm going to invite Jackie to come back out here now 
and she's going to help wrap this up. I'm going to put a little cotton to bring us to the end. Thank you very much. Great job, Pete. Thank you. And I'd like to give uh, some kudos to Jermaine, who worked really hard today yeah, as well. He did a lot Those of work are, That today. was a lot of swinging. That was yeah. a lot of hip hinging. So we do have a little bit of time for questions. If you would like to have us answer some of your questions today, be sure to use the chat bar on your YouTube viewer right now to type in those questions. In the meantime, Pete, how can they get a hold of you if they do have some additional questions? If any additional questions, I'm actually going to be checking the ACE uh, Facebook page. So if you go the American Council on Exercise Facebook page. I'll be checking that back. Um, you can catch me on Twitter. I'm at PeteMC underscore fitness on Twitter. Also Instagram. I've been doing a lot more on Instagram. Like a lot of us have been learning this stuff mm -hmm. as I go. Mm -hmm. And you can always go to my website. My website is Pete McCall Fitness and the email is very easy. Pete Great. at Pete McCall Fitness. Always happy to answer questions. Great. Perfect. So we do have a live Facebook chat that is going on right now. If you would like to have Pete answer a couple more questions after today's presentation, make sure, make sure and check that out. It is on our ACE Fitness Facebook page. So if you did enjoy today's presentation, if you like today's course, we do have a lot of other continuing education for you at the American Council on Exercise. Check out some of our specialty programs, sports conditioning, as well as functional training. And we do have a couple of other webinars that integrate using the kettlebell as part of a way to get our clients to reach their goals. Cool, and as I always remind people, kettlebell is only a tool. You have to know how to use the entire toolbox. So mm -hmm. all I wanted to do today is go over one of the tools so people become a little more comfortable, a little more familiar with it. Great, so let's take a few of your questions right now. One of the things that you mentioned earlier on in the presentation is the difference between the traditional style and the competition style kettlebells. So if someone is going to be putting together a gym, they're looking to you know improve or increase some of the things that they're using, what would you recommend? My, my record, that's a great question. I get that question when I teach, uh, teach a couple of workshops on kettlebells. I would start with a competition kettlebell because they're all the same size. Uh -huh. And so, and what I like about that, especially for some people with smaller arms, is the, the smaller traditional size kettlebells rest right on the wrist and it's really yeah. uncomfortable. The competition kettlebell, because the bell itself is bigger, will rest on the forearm, allowing people to learn proper racking technique and proper motor control with it. So if I were to outfit a gym, a gym from scratch, my preference would be going all competition. Okay, great, perfect. We had that question come in earlier, so thank you. Another question, and, and I'll just link this back to some of the information that ACE has recently put out as one of a, uh, a study that we did on hamstring exercises. And the kettlebell swing showed as one of the exercises that can really boost the activation of the hamstrings. But as you mentioned earlier, we've got a lot of muscles that are connecting back there as we do our hip hinge. How do we work with clients doing the kettlebell swing that might have tightness or you know mobility that's, issues in the hamstrings? That's a good question. And, and one of the reasons why I did that warm-up, Jackie, why I do that with hip mobility, is a lot of times when people think of hamstring tightness, if my hamstrings are tight, mm -hmm. well, I need to stretch my hamstrings. Well, yeah. that's, not, that's not always the case. Right. Because if our hip flexors get tight, what that does is it actually gives us more of an anterior tilt to the pelvis. Mm -hmm. And when the pelvis has an anterior tilt, it lengthens the hamstring, giving us that perception of tightness. Right. So that's why I had to warm up today, start doing hip circles by mobilizing the hip joint right. and starting with the glute bridges. That's one way to increase hamstring length. It's not necessarily that the hamstrings are tight. They're just an imbalance there in the pelvis and, and they might be being lengthened. And so they feel like they're tight when they're not necessarily tight. So we got to wire all those muscles together. That's the one thing we have to remember is no one muscle works by itself in the body. Right. Muscles always work with friends. Mm -hmm. And so when, when we do an integrated pattern, when we do integrated like dynamic movement, we're using a number of them together. And, and for, for the answer to that would be just work on the mobility, work on the hip hinges, mm -hmm. work on the glute bridges. And trust me, within a few weeks, hamstring tightness, out the takes, window. Yeah, it takes care of itself. Right. Yeah. But we want to do all of those things first. Exactly. That's all. That's why it becomes mm -hmm. part of That's why I teach those. I teach, honestly, my, the first few weeks that I'm working with somebody, I'm teaching them like a dynamic warm up, yeah. basically. That becomes their workout. All stability, mobility exercises, all movement. Because I want them moving body weight first. I don't want to just, if you're a new client, I'm not going to give you a 20 pound kettlebell and say, go for it. Right. I need to teach you to move. We need to develop a little rapport. I need you to trust me a little bit. I don't want to hurt you in those first few sessions. Mm -hmm. I don't want to hurt you, period. But if I have you do something beyond your skill level initially, you that that could end that relationship right there. Right. Again, I'd rather have you come back to me. You know what? I think we can work a little bit harder. Fine. That's easy to do. Great. It's much harder to undo an injury. Great. So in putting that, that dynamic warm up in every time is a great way to kind exactly. of see you where say, clients are at. And that's why I'm so, that's why I, I'm so consistent with it mm -hmm. because you could come in one day and you could be 
firing awesome, you're grooving, that, that dynamic warm up, you're nailing it. Yeah. And I know I can push you a little bit harder that day. If you come in that day and maybe you were working on the budget, maybe you know you had something, you went out to a concert the night before, maybe mm-hmm. you didn't get great sleep, mm-hmm. underhydrated, and I'm seeing how you move, and I know how you move normally, and I can see there's a difference in there, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit, I'm gonna probably back down the intensity that yeah. day. Maybe kettlebell swings shouldn't be in your program that day, and instead of doing swings, I have you do hinges, and we work on just wiring everything together. Great. That's one of the things why we want to be so consistent with the dynamic warm-up is I can tell easily. I can tell when you're having a great day, mm-hmm. and I can tell when your days aren't mm-hmm. so great, and I want, to be able to, I want to be able to adjust our program accordingly. Good, good. So we will take one more question. Certainly. Um, and, and you mentioned this with Jermaine earlier. We saw a difference in the height of his arms being raised, and yeah. kind of the, there's varying degrees there of where yeah. the arms can go. Talk to us a little bit about when we see it, and it happens, as you mentioned, the squat to the overhead raise. Yeah. Not necessarily from, uh, yeah, that could be a different exercise that people do, but from the sense of the kettlebell swing itself, what kind of issues might that, or does that cause issues for the shoulder as it's going overhead, and, and what, what kind of things would we want to address there? And that's actually clients? a great, I love that, because I see, and some people do teach a swing where it's all hip and it goes to overhead, mm-hmm. but try this at home. If you lace your thumbs over each other, mm-hmm. like you hold on to a kettlebell handle, mm-hmm. you're internally rotating your shoulder. You're yep. internally rotating that glenohumeral joint. That, the head of the humerus is gonna run into, this is your acromion process of the yep. scapula. So if you try to keep your thumbs together and raise your arms overhead, about right here, you're gonna run into some issues because yeah. that humerus is running into the top of the shoulder blade there. And if I try to force that and I try to pull that through, at some point, whether it's a supraspinatus tendon, whether it's the long head of the biceps, we're gonna get some, somebody there is not gonna be happy. Yeah. And that's when you get inflammation. When somebody gets happy, they get itis, they get inflamed. Uh-huh. So we might get a super, you know, a supraspinatus tendonitis, we might get something happen. And because if you take your arms overhead repeatedly, you just don't have much space in the shoulders there. Mm-hmm. And so that could cause aggravation. So just keeping the kettlebell to about chest height or lower, and what Jermaine was doing is a hard style. And the hard style is where you pull down more, you generate more force pulling the kettlebell down. That's actually where we use our lats to pull our arms down, right. then we drive explosively from the hips. That's creating much more power throughout the entire chain. As people are learning it, they're gonna pop up and that kettlebell might float a little bit higher, that's fine, mm-hmm. as long as the arms are just there for a lever. Right. But that's a good question, because I get concerned when I see that kettlebell going overhead, that just know at some point there's gonna be a shoulder injury there. Exactly. Maybe not, not, maybe not the first time, but at some point we're just increasing the risk of injury, and, and my job, our job as trainers, right, Jackie, mm-hmm. is we want to try to minimize any risk of injury. Right, great. So all of those points, really important to keep in mind when we're working with clients, especially new clients yeah. that maybe are just unfamiliar of how their body's working or what they're feeling yeah. and, and are getting used to these new movement patterns. Right? And, that, and that's why it's so important to teach the movement skills first. Yep. I, I really, I, I can't emphasize that enough. It doesn't matter the age, it doesn't matter the training experience. Teach movement. I mean, I, I'm a big fan of Gray Cook, and if you teach people to move better, they can move more often. And I don't want it. Yeah, I know you have Sam on here quite a bit. Sam yeah. Barry is a big proponent of that. Yeah. And I know he's talked about that. We anybody, we can always teach somebody to move harder, but we got to teach them how to move better first. Right. And so I want to teach that hip hinge movement. And like I said, if I, if I see you bending over, pick something up. I want you, I want to know that reflexively using your hips, you're not going to use your back. That lets me know I've done my job. Great. So all of those great points that we want to make sure we're emphasizing with our clients, especially for the kettlebell swing. So thank you very much. Remember, you watch today for free. If you would like to earn your CECs for today's course, you can purchase them on our website by following the link. There's a little video that you can view in order to purchase those CECs. And we do have a number, another upcoming live webinar that will be happening next month and make sure to tune in for that and that will be on training our aging baby boomer population. So a lot of great information will be shared there as well. Pete, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, it's been fun. Yeah, so we have a lot of different ways that you can connect with ACE and still remember to connect with Pete through Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. Thank you so much for joining us today and let's get people moving.